a lot of people think about cams and like, hey, I want a cam. And it's like, well, what do you do with a car? Oh yeah, street drive, it's daily. I'm like, why do you want a cam then? What do you recommend for people who are trying to spec cams for their build? Brand new G80 S58 motor, 1200 horsepower. What are you gonna recommend to me as far as the camshaft goes? Chop. Chop. Like to me, it's like, I don't necessarily think that's the greatest thing in the world. Like I'm more about like the high strung, like high RPM, just winging it. Not just the car at idle, like about to sound like it's about to stop running. Would you go watch drifting if there was no noise, like from the engine? What would that sound like? We need to discuss how you took a Toyota <laughs> And you pulled the motor out and you decided that you're going to put a Nissan RB26 in it. I don't know, the B50 is cool, but I don't know, I just feel like the RB's just got more character. A lot more character. Why do all the fastest cars run GSC? Because it's the best. Welcome back to another episode of the Street Alpha Podcast. I am your host, Tukes, and we are in South Carolina today, over here at GSC, hanging out with Greg. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Uh, it's my first time in South Carolina, I think, actually like staying here. So we're here. We finally made it. When we were in the, I don't even know what the rooms are called, because you have um, so many. We have <laughs> labs and inspection, QC labs and yeah. one, uh, one of the labs R&D we lab. In. lab and so one of the labs we were in, we were talking about how you actually started with trying to figure out building a cam for Evo? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically it all started with, I guess I want to say the Evo 8 platform. Evo 8, uh, right. So the, yeah, this is way back in 04, 05. That's really what started it. It, 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 it. it all derived from like a passion for turbo cars. I grew up and, and was into cars in general. Yeah. Uh, it didn't matter what it was. I mean, I think one of my first cars was like a Z28 Camaro with an LT1 in it and a Corvette. And then it's like, I got hit with, you know, in 95, I know that's probably predating you was like, I <laughs> saw a Supra, uh, a Mark IV. And I think I probably saw one of the very first like single turbo conversions from Gretti um, back then. And it was like, as soon as I heard that, I was like, I gotta, I gotta, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, and like that, I think really sparked just an interest in, in, into the kind of the Japanese sport compact turbo cars. Yeah. Um, so, uh, really when it came to, you know, camshafts, it was like, you know, I was young, I was in my twenties and trying to figure out what to do with my life. You know, this is before, you know, anything crazy came along as far as internet and the possibility of doing, you know, social media stuff and all the fun stuff you guys do. Magazine today. days. The magazine days, yeah. man, you made it a magazine and you like hit the gold rush. Right. Like that was the the pinnacle of it. Now it's like you did put something up on YouTube and got a million likes That's and it. you're the, you're the, you're the man. It's changed dramatically. Yeah, it has, but you know, it's all still the same in respect, I guess. Right. And, uh, you know, we were selling parts and it was always, you know, in the Japanese scene, it was always, we were waiting for whatever container came in from the West coast to, to be able to sell parts to people, you know, mm -hmm. there was, there was demand on the east coast but you know we were still waiting so it's like I, I remember getting being able to buy hks cams and it's like however many you bought you put them on the shelf for an evo and it was like you know it was gold like people wanted them it was like easy horsepower you put it in you did head studs you did you know a fuel pump and a boost controller and a tune and you were you know picking up 50 60 horsepower and it's like stock turbo like you know it was just awesome and then you ran out and people were like oh i want this and you're like oh uh yeah we gotta wait until we get more so it kind of you know turned into like why are we waiting for this like there's plenty of of ability for this to be made or manufactured here yeah. like why are we waiting on this and and that's really what you know kind of led me down this rabbit hole that has turned into you know pretty big facility that does quite a bit of interesting things across many platforms. So. Yeah, so did you have, do you have like a background in, in, in engineering or anything like that or? Uh, I'd say I have more help? passion than a background. I definitely have had classes in, in 
you know, engineers are special people and I, uh, <laughs> I enjoy them and, you know, work well with them. But uh, no, I did not decide to, to finish out a full college degree in engineering. Uh, I always say I, I look at engineers and designers, uh, you know, you look at like people that build houses and you think about architects and engineer, like you still get an architect to design you something and then you have an engineer to like, say like, oh, you can do this or you can't do this. Right. And right. Uh, I feel like that's kind of the crossroads where like I, my technical ability is, is that, you know, I might have an idea and might be able to put some together and get it 90% there. But when it really comes to make sure that, you know, things are, are fully thought out, whether it be material aspects or design wise, like, yeah, we still have people that, you know, make sure and get us over the finish line that we're doing the, the better parts that, that we should be. So when did you, how long have you been in business officially with, uh, with GSC? Like when did you actually start? I guess 2001. 2001. It's 23 years. Wow. Four years, whatever. Yeah. So what does it look like compared to like having machines like this now and when you first started? You know, in the early days, it was really more about like reselling parts, getting parts, um, a little bit of shop stuff, like really not a terrible amount. It was more like the online presence of being able to offer them. I mean, obviously playing with our own cars or my own car and doing things like, you know, road racing, a um, little bit of drag racing and, you know, but nothing to the level of what, you know, we kind of support at this point, but yeah, because I remember like it was like, oh, great, we're going to like just deal with making our own parts. Like, I don't want to deal with anybody else's stuff. You know, we're just going to have our own brand and focus on that. And it's um, it's it's interesting. Like, I, I go back and look at like what we did back then. And and uh, I remember having a conversations with uh, one of the owners of turn 14. And it was like, you know, hey, like I'm you know, we were friends uh, at that point. We were, you know, in the industry, we were technically competitors, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I just remember them being like, hey, we were in the retail space. Now we're just moving into to distribution. And I was like, look, I'm I'm just going to move into to manufacturing. And it was like, hey, like, let's, you know, we'll, we'll we're already selling your part. Like, we'll just make this more of a thing. And, right. you know, that was, I think, 07, 08. And then it was like, as soon as we kind of started to transition into that, like, of course, like 08, 09, the bottom falls out of the market. And it's like, oh, great. Like, <laughs> was this a smart move? But then it's like, I'm watching people in the real estate business, like, you know, yeah. selling everything that they own. Nobody can do anything. I'm like, well, I want to say it was like a pretty short lived recession for the performance guys. Um, I just oh. remember like, the bottom falling out and then like two or three months later we were kind of doing numbers that we were doing before and i'm like well like everybody else is complaining but yeah. like we're working on new parts getting stuff done and like people are still interested apparently you know you can live off of ramen noodles and whatever as long as you can make it to the drag strip and make a pass <laughs> like let's go basically we kind of found something that we that i enjoyed and liked and you know there's definitely aspects of camshafts as far as being able to spec it you know understanding the way that it it works in the motor. I mean, it's, you know, your mechanical tuning of the engine. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, like you said, I mean, a lot of people don't understand it. They don't get it. They're like, oh yeah, we just put it in and it works. And right, it's right. like, well, you know, I always kind of hyper-focus on things that I'm interested in. And that's where it like really just has always got, come from. It's mm -hmm. just the fact that you just like, I deep dive into it and, yeah. you know, there's not a ton of data. And I can tell you that I've looked through more, engineering mechanical engineering textbooks on cam design and lobe design and and things than i probably ever did in college of, you know with a finance degree it was like i picked it up and i read it like it was you know the gospel i'm like god this is amazing like why am i actually looking at this yeah. like it was fascinating i could apply it it made sense and i was just like well how does this work well how do we how does it make it better like you know the same questions that you just ask is like what do I need to put in this car? Like yeah. what makes it work? I just listen to other people and let them go. But do those people actually know what they're talking about? Or are yeah. they just like, yeah, just put this in. Oh, it fired up. Yeah. Run it. You know, you can do some pretty amazing things when it comes with some of the engines, like that they still work. It's, you know, yeah. getting it right is, is a definitely takes a little bit of skill and understanding. So, you know, but you know, that goes into the passion idea. Like, right. You can't stop somebody that wants to learn. And if there's not really a great, education path to do it like sometimes you have to you know forge your own way and and kind of dig in and blow some shit up 
<laughs> that's the only way you learn, right? I mean, you know, every time we break something, it's kind of like, well, that's the end of it. We know yeah. that's the limit, so we don't need to go there anymore. Right. Uh, what do we do now? And luckily, we've definitely put a lot of that, you know, in our rear view, so to speak. But, right, right. So um, if you're learning with camshafts, right, you, you started doing some um, some research on that. Can you kind of explain the basics like of how a camshaft works? Sure. I mean, a camshaft basically controls the air in and out of the combustion chamber, right? Like right. That's the simple aspect of it. We're going to open the, open the valves, how long we're going to keep them open, how much we're going to keep them open, whether it be the intake, the exhaust, how, how much time we're going to basically share with them both open to clean a cylinder, um, when we're going to close them, at what point in the combustion cycle, or really the four-stroke cycle, that we're going to open and close them. And, uh, you know, uh, like I said, it's the mechanical tuning of the end of the engine when it comes down to it. Now, when it comes to making camshafts, what are the kind of um, materials that you use to make them? So, I mean, there's there's multiple different variants of what can be used to create a camshaft. Like you can have an assembled camshaft. You can have a forged billet camshaft. You can have multiple different cast versions, whether it be a chill cast gray iron. You can have ductile iron that's heat treated like. Right. There is, uh, you know, I think some of the neater stuff like we talked about earlier is kind of the assembled stuff that the OEM does. And the reason why they do it is is one of the things that we talked about was like, you know, how do they produce millions and millions of camshafts when and save money on it? It's all about like how much material they're using, like how many CC, how much volume of material is being used. So, yeah, um, you know, what we do is is at GSC is is pretty much 100 percent of what we produce is all a forged billet uh camshaft meaning we start with forged bar stock and we're basically turning milling grinding um from just a bar into a finished camshaft right um so there's a lot of advantages to that cleanliness of materials um you know there's no holes in it as far as being casted um you know we can control a lot aspects of the design of it what's needed what's not needed it's stronger um, the yield strength the material is better you know we don't have to worry about uh, brittle cam snapping randomly. Like if you, if you snap a billet cam, like you did an awesome job. <laughs> like, I don't think we've ever seen that, you know, you might bend it, but you're definitely not going to break it. Yeah. Um, unless you really screwed up. Right. Right. When it comes to the machining part of it, right. Um, what is the first stage of that process? So usually it's, uh, it's either going to be, you know, drilling or for the most part, what we're going to do is turn a camshaft, meaning we're going to basically take and make uh, a 2D outline of the cam mm -hmm. and we're going to make everything in rounds um, to start with. And we're going to set some features in it, whether it be on the face, front, back. Maybe we're going to set some trigger angles depending on which cam it is. Yeah. Uh, and from there, we're going to move it out of there and we're going to go into some milling so that we're going to mill our lobe shape so that we get our firing order correct and kind of our um you know some of the trigger angles are also done in the mills and then you know we're going to round that out with um some grinding um whether it be journals and then lobes and we're going to finish in a heat treat process you know a lot of people will start with different conditions of materials mm -hmm. um we basically start with a material that is almost exactly as hard as a minimum call out would be for like a chill cast cam which makes okay. it really really hard to turn like trust me my tooling guys love love us for the amount of money we spend on going through carbide tooling um, but it allows us to you know not have to deal quite as extensively with the heat treat process because the material itself starts to such a hard state yeah it's harder to machine however it's better for more consistent through the part um, and then when we finish it we're basically going in and we're putting more of a a harder surface um, kind of through the input. Right. Um, and that helps, you know, it, it helps us in a small uh, run manufacturing scenario. It allows us to do the billet stuff. I mean, when I, when I basically said, hey, we want to get away from doing anything with cast cams because we were relying on a foundry that was semi-finishing stuff that had long lead times. I mean, we, we tried to get GTR blanks made for the VR38 you know, probably in 2010, 11. And I remember it being like 18 months. And I was like, this just is stupid. Like, why do I have to wait 18 months? Um, and it, it really boils down to like, in order to, you know, to gain access to those foundries and stuff that are making them like, you know, we basically are their fill time. Like they were filling 
orders for tier one, you know, somebody's ordering a million camshafts. I don't know if it's a million, but yeah, a huge amount. Oh, and it's you, like, yeah. hey, we need, you know, 200 sets of these. They're like, yeah, we'll get to that when we got time. Like, we'll fill it in. So that was kind of the idea. It's like, well, they don't care about us. So like, what do we have to do to make this? And right. it basically, you know, again, kept some some long nights and 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 a lot of you can't do this and you know with anybody in the car industry if you tell somebody you can't do it like they're like oh yeah here you know hold my beer let me get this done yeah yeah like that's just the way it goes right so when when it comes to like customers what do you recommend for people who are trying to spec cams for their build i mean you know it all boils down to to really you know rpm band and when you're talking about turbos like there's you know the size of the turbo makes a huge impact on when it's going to spool and where your rpm band is you said turbo though you don't so you only focus on turbo I, I mean for the most part i think 97 percent of our catalog maybe five percent of our catalog is all turbo based um camshafts okay um and it's it's really kind of it's what's you know, it's kind of what excites me. I mean, I, as a individual, like I, uh, turbo stuff's more fun. I mean, I, I totally respect NA stuff and certain platforms are awesome and I'd love to do something, but it's, it's one of those things. Like if, if I'm making a part for somebody and I want to put a smile on your face and I'm going to be like, Hey, this set of cams is going to be a thousand dollars. And then you're going to have to tune it and install it. And it's going to cost you a few thousand dollars to do this. Like, I don't want somebody to be like, man, you made seven horsepower, like awesome. Like, I'm like, what did you do that for? Like, you should have probably gone somewhere else. Like, yeah. So that's where I kind of, you know, and I'm not saying all of it works exactly like that, but, you know, you're really fighting for every last ounce of power out of a lot of NA stuff. Um, and it, it really becomes more of a tailored, you know, scenario as far as fitting that cam properly to what you're doing with the car. You know, okay. a lot of people think about cams and like, Hey, I want a cam. And it's like, well, what do you do with a car? Oh yeah. Street drive is daily. I'm like, why do you want a cam then? You know, for the most part, if you're, you know, driving around at sub 3000 RPMs, is it really necessary? Well, you know, my buddy's got one and that's what I should probably, you know, he, his car sounds awesome. So you want <laughs> one. So it sounds good. It's like, okay, that that's a different animal. Right. Um, but you know, when it, when it really boils down to like what's necessary and where a customer is going to, you know, get the most enjoyment out of it. You know, I, I, we often ask the question, it's just pretty simple. Like, what are you doing with a car? Like, that's the first thing is what's the goal? Like, oh, I want to go drifting or I'm drag racing. I'm, you know, I want to run a seven second time slip. I want a six second time slip. Like just depends what their, what their end goal is and, and how we match it. Um, you know, and a lot of people look at like, oh, I want this much lift and this much duration. And it's like, well, what are you really after? You know, there, there might be limitations to what a cam can actually do when somebody asks for something custom or special, you know, if they want, oh, I want a 12 millimeter lift cam. And it's like, well, that sounds great. But like, there's no room in the head for a spring that's going to support a 12 mil lift cam. And, you know, the base circle and the diameter of the bucket is so small that like, I, I can't really put anything in it that's gonna have a lot of aggression. So it's like, yeah, you hit a number, but you know, you might be able to get more power out of something that's smaller or better, you know, tailored to your specific setup. Right, right. Do you find like a lot of customers or people that when they automatically start talking about like lift that they don't really know too much about how it works? That seems um, like to usually like, like the, the biggest tell if somebody has no idea is when they like talk about advertised duration, like I want a 280 degree camshaft and like your S3 and I'm like, okay, what for? Like, <laughs> I want you to get in your car and be like, this is the most badass thing you've ever got. And I think you're going to be like, man, this thing runs like crap at idle. And, you know, I have a small turbo on it and I'm shifting it. 5,000 RPMs because you have no need to twist yeah. it to 9,000 or 10,000 RPMs. Right. So, so it seems like people, when they get so hyper-focused on one specific spec, that kind of tells you how far, like how, how much knowledge they have when it yeah. comes to it. Well, I mean, it's always a, it's a give and a take, right? Like, yeah. you know, you know, I feel like our job is like, you know, usually somebody when they they're calling and they tell you what they want, they just want to be reassured that they're making the right decision. Right. So like at that point, it's like, you know, Am I going to really like take the time and effort to say like, hey, you want to put an S2 on a car that probably should be on an S1, you know, uh, and 
is it going to be the end of the world? Like, you know, I might say, hey, you know, you you probably be better served in an S1 set than an S. Oh no, my buddy's got an S2 set. I might get put a bigger turbo on it later. And it's like, well, like how much later? Like two weeks or you know, you really have no plan to do it, but you want it already done. Yeah. Like, I think one of the biggest, you know, issues is somebody says like, I want to do this once. Well, it's like, what, you know, are you telling me you're going to build your car once and like, that's it? Like, you're never going to put a different turbo on it. You're never going to do anything else. Then it's like, well, then that's your plan. Like, then you need to, that's where you go. But don't say like, I want to put this in now. Mm, like, I, I'm guilty of that. I do that a lot. Well, I mean, you know, it's like I got you got some of the plan and then the plans change as money frees up or like, you know, your yeah. build goes a certain way. But, you know, sometimes it's not always the best to say, like, let me plan for the future, like plan for right now. Like, what are you doing right now? And let's make sure that, like, you're in the right thing. And, you know, hey, at the end of the, you know, it's better for us if you say, well, I've used this. This is great. But you know what? I'm putting a 74 millimeter turbo on this thing. And now it's time to, you know, step it up. I want to do this. But what about because. The thing with that is, and I can kind of speak on that, that mindset is I don't want to go back and spend money again. Like I want to just overbuild this. So I don't have to go. So I don't have to worry about it later on. So well, I, I, it might be different for camshafts, but for like, I guess other aspects, like maybe like a fuel, it's not, it's obviously not a fuel system, but like if you put a fuel, a fuel system in there, that's rated for, you know, that, that supports up to 1500 horsepower. I don't have to worry about that. Cause I know I'm going to be within a threshold of power. You know, I always like to. I, I often used to think that way and it came to clutches. And I know most cars these days. Clutches like, too, yeah. Similar. And somebody's like, oh yeah, I want a clutch that'll hold a thousand horsepower. And it's like, well, do you have a thousand horsepower? No, I got to make 500, but I don't want to ever have to do this again. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like you're putting all that stress and strain of like that gripping force into your gear set. Like yeah. you're putting more wear and tear on your engine or your transmission than you really should be if you're not there and right. like it's a, a clutch is like you know usually the the higher power it holds the more it's an on off switch and mm -hmm. you know the drivability definitely deteriorates because it's got to be able to hold that power so it's like you know live in the now like you know who knows like you know in the end like you know i, I maybe i think about it differently but i just i see people that put stuff in that's too big and i'm 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 one of those people that you know, I'm, I don't always want the biggest thing. Like, I'm not like, Hey, go to the top of the catalog. Cause that's what you need. Mm -hmm. Like I I'm usually like, I want to go small and lean on it harder until it's not falling off. And you know, that's kind of when you, that's when you make the decision to say, Hey, I want to go up in a size. Like, right. It's like, I've hit a wall, like we, we need more and I'm pushing it higher or, or, you know, if you, you're really matching, like I said earlier, it's like you're matching your your torque curve your power curve to the turbo that you have with your cam like you want your cam working you want your tur turbo working like that's going to put the biggest smile on your face on a daily then like hey i got a turbo that lights off at 3000 rpms and i got a cam that really is coming in at like 5500 like right. you're missing a good section of like smile factor right 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 Let's say if I was specking out a camshaft for my build, right? And I was, wanted to make like uh 50 For the BMW, power. I mean, for, for the, the Toyota. <laughs> for that's the super, got a RV right? in it? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Well, all right. I guess in, <laughs> in a sense of having an RV, right? Let's not even say my car. Let's let's get that out we the way. We can go that route. I'm cool with it. So, yeah, I guess I guess treat treat me like as if I'm a customer. Like what what would be the process like? I'm making, I want to make 1500 horsepower. You're sitting on a couch right now. Sit on the couch on a podcast. Do you you probably need to lay down and we need to discuss how you took a Toyota <laughs> And you pulled the motor out and you decided that you're going to put a Nissan RB26 in it. I feel like we had this conversation before. I'm on just, the phone. I'm still trying to grasp this. Like, you was know, it, did we have this conversation already or no? Probably wasn't me. Yeah, we probably did. We probably I did. Know. I don't remember maybe. what I said to you, but yeah, I know. I get the same reaction every single time. Um, but maybe that's what it is. Like, I need to be like, you want to, I mean, you know, I'll be honest. Like, any inline six is always a, an awesome, an RB26, a 2J, like singing at, you know, 8,000 plus RPMs is, is a beautiful noise. I don't know, the B58 is cool, but I don't know, I just feel like the RB's just got more character, a lot more character than a B58. And not a 2J. A 2J has character, but I don't feel like it has as much character as an RB. I feel like in, in the States, we are so used to the 2J, like we have that platform here. The RB, we really never had. So in a much smaller population, like, you know, Australia, obviously, those guys are doing big things with that platform. I'm usually the kind of person that's more into 
things that people aren't really exposed to. Like I'm not really much yeah, of a something different. Let me do something different. Yeah, I always like to do something different, and I feel like that's modifying a car, though, right? Like yeah, you're making course. it yours. You're making you're choosing the parts you want. Like it's right. yours. It's different. And I think that it's just a platform that um, I feel like. If, I wish if we had it over here, the same way we had the two J, I feel like it would be pretty much neck and neck. Oh, I, I guarantee it. I feel because of the amount of people, the amount of R and D, um, the money that has been invested into the, just overall the research and development of the 2J platform itself. I'm not doing a 26 anymore, but even the RB30s, these guys are breaking records with it. So it's 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 a good platform. But I it's think. a 26 head. 26 head. I'm sure that has limitations as well. But I'm not going to be the guy who's going 2,500 horsepower, 2,000 horsepower. You know. I mean, what are you realistically trying to do? Like eight, nine hundred thousand? Nah, it, it, it was eight hundred. But now I'm I'm shooting for like 13, 1400 horsepower. Oh yeah, good. You're in the that, that's it's gonna run every day perfectly. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so so what cam what cam would you recommend for a for a setup like that? So like I uh, you know again I said like small is always my favorite. The RB poses a lot of a lot more interesting things that go on with putting it in. Like you know they they decided to run an oil jacket down all of the bucket bore. So like you're really limited on the amount of lift you can run without reducing the base circle of the cam. Okay. Uh, base circle is like, uh, it's where you set lash at. It's the round part of, semi round part of a, a cam. Mm -hmm. um, so like as you reduce that, uh, you basically make it more complex to, to put in for the installer. Like, you know, you might have to run longer valves. You might have to run a longer bucket. Um, you know, you might have to clearance the cylinder head, but you know, the, the engines really work out well when you kind of do that. So if you're if you're going down that aspect mm -hmm. and saying, I'm willing to have somebody set up the head properly and do it, Dave. like, yeah, you know, he's a head great, games. great person. You know, he, he does a lot. I and mean, there's nobody that enjoys uh, kind of turbo cars more than uh, yeah. that dude does. At <laughs> shout least out in the to cylinder Dave. Home. Yeah. I didn't even give him a shout out for this. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, in that respect, uh, you know, if it's set up right, like I would probably go down to into some of our R series cams, like an R1 or R1.5. R1 is going to be a little small for 1300, but a 1 1.5 or an R2, uh, it's going to be kind of right in the, the ballpark. I mean, but it's still a street car. It's going to be a, I mean, what are you doing for a transmission? <laughs> is that see, a whole nother problem? Oh, oh, right now, right now. See, that's what I'm saying. Like I'm already, you're going through this right now with me. And I'm kind of like, damn, you said R, you said R1, R1.5. And I'm like, nah, man, just go like, what, is there like an R2 cam? Yeah, we yeah. got R2, just we got go R3. R2. Oh. Said, in my head, it's put like, put a big one R2. in. Yeah, put a big one in. Cause it's like, I don't want to like, just dude, I'll, 13 1400 all right maybe i'll go yeah, 1700. i mean yeah but i mean that's more like an <laughs> 1800 2000 so i'm like in the end like you're you're pushing the rpm band higher and like you're sacrificing things like throttle response that isn't really shown on a dyno graph but like mm -hmm. that's really the most enjoyable part of the car like if you you know light that turbo off or whatever like the yeah. car starts running and you hear and it goes like that's that's what makes you happy right so like that's what i don't like it's hard to explain that to people and get them to say like that's what i want like i need i want to I want to feel this thing move and rip. Right. And like you start putting stuff that's too big in and that's where you, you kind of lose that. And you're like, yeah, this thing just isn't really, you know, as much fun. I mean, I see more people that put stuff that's oversized things and they're like, yeah, that just really wasn't, wasn't right. Like, you know, I just didn't, didn't like it. It's like, well, you should have put the small one in. I think I'm going to put a, you know, put a smile on your face. So and ripped R it. R1, R1 cam. I'd probably do the the split in the middle, like it's an oh. eleven mil kind of deal. Like, tell me, tell me about this R one, this R, like your your series of cams. So usually we You're we kind of space it out. Like I don't want to overcomplicate things because you really don't have to. Like with with overhead stuff, you've got you know whether it be usually you always have two gears, whether it be two phasers that are controlled by the ECU or one phaser that's controlled by the ECU, but you definitely have independent control of things like overlap, mm -hmm. which is the amount of time that the, you know, intake cam and the exhaust cam are open at the same point. Right. So like if you're able to control that either with, you know, mechanical setups with cam gears or with the phasers, like it really lets you kind of spread what a, what a cam profile is going to be good for. You know, there's not really a case where, you know, a lot of the domestic guys that are push rod or LS, like, you know, they've got to build that overlap into a specific cam. So like there could be a huge catalog of like, Hey, I need to have, you know, this amount of LSA split for this kind of application, but I really use the same profiles to do this with it because mm -hmm. I just need to, to kind of tweak it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that to me in, in our aspect really kind of confuses people like it's just too much. I don't want people to get overwhelmed. So it's like, 
you know, we've, we've cut it down and tried to keep it as minimal. Now that's not to say like, I, I can't, I mean, at this point, I think we have, you know, five to six different RB profiles, six, six or seven different RB profiles. There's mm -hmm. probably five of the two J. Um, but you know, it's all about, you know, how much of a pain in the butt you want to deal with. Like if you, you stick to the S stuff, I'm not saying it's all easy to, to go, but it definitely, you know, it's easier to install. There's less chance for, you know, Hey, I didn't clearance this enough or, or, you know, things along that aspect. Or, yeah. You know, I need to make sure that I, you know, just, I have just the right amount of spring, uh, in it. Otherwise I'm going to end up with some problems. So, you know, so you guys pretty much figured out what I, what I don't want to. I try to make it as simple for as you simple. to be like, yeah, I don't know. I just keep buying this and it works. And it's yeah. like, as long as it keeps working and you keep breaking records, like that's good enough. Yeah. That I was going to say, cause it seems like the specs on the website, like they're not like a full spec sheet. That's them. because like as designing them and, and utilizing and making a cam, like I, I, there's so much more that is in a cam profile than mm -hmm. just simply like lift 40 or 50 thousands duration, advertised duration, what the, what the opening and closing events are, where, where your lobe separation is like that kind of stuff is it's important information, but like as a cam designer, like there's so much more that we look at to make it work. Yeah. Um, so like that's kind of where the, the black magic comes in, right? you right. know? So, you know, we, we have to, we have, it's a balancing act when it comes to making them. Yeah. You know, we're, we're looking at things that are way past just, Hey, when do we open it and when do we cut it, close it? Like that's more of a engine builder that says, Hey, you know, I think we need a little bit more duration. Well, w where are we going with this? Like when it comes to just duration, usually that means you're shifting something higher in the RPM band. Right. You know, um, are you really shifting it higher? Do you want it just to be bigger? Do you need more area under the curve for the profile? Like, mm -hmm. do you want to put more lift and more duration in so that you can get more air in because you're running a stroker motor that needs more displacement to fill? If if that's the aspect, like, yeah, it can get it can get more technical, but there's, you know, other things as far as, you know, we're always limited in design really by by the system that we're working with. Like, you know, whether it be a a roller finger follower, a type two system, like a, an Evo or a coyote, or, uh, you know, even a B 58 or S 58 kind of has that, that, or is it a direct acting system like a RB or a two J, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, or is it a push rod motor, which we don't really do much of at all. Any. Yeah. I know you said that you don't really do any LS. Stuff. It's a whole nother animal. That's just, you know, it's got to excite us. And that's one of the things that, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem. I respect it. It's a, it's a car, yeah. you know, and I like them, but you know, a new Z06 or a ZR1 is a pretty awesome, you know, vehicle <laughs> in my opinion. And it's like, you know, I used to have a Corvette. I had an LT in it. It's like, Hmm, I think these are badass now. Yeah. Like they're going to a whole nother level. The, and it sounds like a Ferrari and who doesn't, you know, a I, Ferrari that, that you can modify without getting like paper sent to your house. What a C8? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what I said. I literally said that. I thought I was the only one and nobody, everyone. I didn't I, even hear that. Would you say it on a podcast? No, I said it. I said it. Uh, I, I actually heard that car. So I don't know what exhaust he had on it. This guy pulled out like a year ago. I went to a car show, a local car show, and I, I swore it was a Ferrari. I turned around. It was a black C8. And I was like, <laughs> what? But um, kind of off topic. The one thing I don't like about this, this camshaft stuff is it's like it's it's so it's not black or white. No, like it's. And I'm black, that kind of black art, buddy. I'm like this way or that way. And it's always like, there's too many factors. Yeah. There's a lot of variables that go into it. And like, you can, you can attack it a lot of different ways. And like, that's, that's kind of the benefit to it as well though, because yeah. it allows us to live inside of, you know, what's available. Like I might not be able to put 12.7, but you know, when you start talking about low barrier and like what the total amount that you're opening the valve, mm -hmm. like, you might be able to get that done with a longer, wider duration and less lift, and you can still like a, basically accomplish the same goal. So it's it's a balancing act of like you know what you need to do to make something work to get more airflow. Right, right. Because I mean, it's an air pump at the end of the day. Like that's that's what an engine is. Is there any type of like numbers you should actually look at if you're trying to go for a certain horsepower range? You know, um, it's like everybody always throws that advertised duration and say like, some people say, oh, okay. that doesn't mean anything. Like, what is it? And it's like, you know, it does mean something. You know, it just depends. It depends how long it is. Because a lot of times that advertised duration, if it's somewhat accurate, yeah. like it really can set the stage for kind of how aggressive it is off the seat. 
And, you know, once you go into your 40 or 50 thou number, it's going to tell you how steep it is. And usually that's just going to tell you, like, you know, is it going to be a really fast ramp? And is it really going to move a lot, you know, a lot on the bottom? And then it's a question of like, where does the, where does the head really move a lot of air? You know, right. what are you gaining from, from moving a lot of air at the bottom versus at the top? Is it a tumble port or is it, you know, there's just, there's a lot of different aspects that go into it. And, and I'm sorry if I don't keep it, 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 it gets to be a little vague because I deal with so many different platforms. Right. And, and, you know, one of the things that we do is like when we, we don't do every platform out there, but like when we when we concentrate on a platform, like we're in it, like we're looking at it for, I mean, six months, a year or longer and like studying what, what the head's doing, how it's flowing, like what it's being used for, how the engines are running. And it's not just like, oh yeah, we make cams and we'll just throw whatever on it. And here we got another one here. We got another first to market. Yeah, we're good here. Like throw this out there. Like we've taken our time. We study it. We, we learn the engine. We learn what it wants. We learn what it takes, what it can handle, what it's doing. If it's worth it to do, like, you know, we're not going to do everything out there because it's just, you know, it's not really feasible and we just kind of start trying to stay dedicated. Okay. So can we talk about your, um, your BMW stuff? Like you have some, you have some involvement in some of the BMW stuff and a lot of the guys who are breaking records, um, have your, have your, yeah, your we were, uh, on. you know, the B58 and the S58 are, are definitely some, uh, some newer platforms for us. You know, yeah. we've, we've been kind of playing with them for, I want to say going on probably a year at this point. Um, I think we kind of really kind of hit hit the market. I want to say in February, February, March this year, um, and it's a uh, it's an interesting system. It's it's uh, you know one day I'll it find is, yeah. I'll find that engineer that that designed that stuff, and you know there might be a foot that goes somewhere it shouldn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's it's an interesting platform. It's an interesting engine, and it's uh, it's really it's really impressive what it's done. You know, it's it's definitely been some some building blocks to kind of get it where it's at. But, you know, you, you can't shy away from the fact that you can have a, you know, car that runs in the eights and you can drop your kids off at school and, you know, drive it to work and do all the things you do. I mean, that, you know, it's kind of unheard of when you start talking about like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s cars. I mean, outside of a GTR. Yeah. Like it's pretty darn impressive, um, you know, and it's it's relatively a, a small list. And, you know, I've. I enjoy, I like BMWs, but I feel like they're kind of for, you know, they're more of a sports car. Like I've always thought of them as like, Hey, this guys are going to the road course, you know? And now it's like, all of a sudden we've got all wheel drive in them and, you know, turbos and they're going fast in the quarter and they're, you know, it's just, it, it puts the power down and it goes and it's, yeah. it's really impressive. I mean, I, I, I think I had a conversation at Texas 2K and it was like, you know, when did this, when did this become such a, thing and it really is is it's kind of a, a breath of fresh air for the industry you know i mean we could sit around and make 2j and rb and subaru and evo parts but like you know having something else to play in is is a lot of fun um yeah. and it's it was complex like i said there's been many a sleepless nights and a lot of money spent on trying to get that system kind of dialed in and working correctly and um you know it's it was a learning curve mm -hmm. um and not without hurdles, like there's definitely like, what are they trying to do and why is this happening and where do we need to stay within? But, you know, we, we got it done and, you know, I think we've got a great, a great offering for both platforms. So what do you offer for the BMW? So for the B58 and the S58, we've got valves, valve train, valve, valves, valve springs, guides, uh, and cams for, um, kind of the, the Gen 2, the, the Toyota Supra, the later, um, BMW, we've got like the earlier um, Gen 1 version of it. Um, and then of course the S58 and the, the S58's, you know, if, it's just, I guess with the transmission that's there, like I always think of the S58 and it's like all wheel drive and it's like an eight speed and like it, it works, it goes. And I don't know, I, I really like that platform. I mean, I, I uh, we drove a an M4 at Texas 2K. I, I jumped on a Toro and was like, "Oh crap, we can get a." I was like, "We're gonna choose one of two things. I'm either getting a we're either getting a M3, M4, or a Coyote. Like, we got to do some market research here." Yeah, yeah. You know, and the Coyote is another big one. I mean, I, of course, we were like, "Yeah, let's get a Lambo," and I'm like, "Yeah, that's not gonna happen." <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't need to spend twenty five hundred dollars a day to see how this works. You know, I'll go see Sissio and do some hot laps, and we'll we'll get enough done there. So, so um, the 
so the S58 and the B58, um, when it comes to those two, uh, I guess, valve trains, is there any significant difference? In oh, yeah. I mean, the they kind of did. <laughs> they share parts? like is Yeah. Like, so our, our valves, our valves are shared. It's just the same spring, but like there's some different heights in it. So we kind of changed the retainer to make up for that. Um, and then the cams, they, you know, they're on a different base circle on the intake. And, you know, there's definitely different trigger angles and stuff like that that go into it. Um, and of course, on the exhaust, there's two fuel pumps versus one on the B. So, you know, there's differences, you know, are they close? Yeah. Does it share everything? No, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's similar. So, right. you know, a lot of the same idea, you know, developing, developing the software to create the profile, you know, and what was needed to get it done, you know, is, is, is similar. I mean, the, the geometry is a little bit different, but so Still where usable. do you feel like where do you feel like the BMW is right now in terms of like um, its potential? Because obviously they're breaking records, as we all know. Sure. Um, yeah, so, they're marching into it, right? Like, they, yeah. you know, it's like and they're going like, you know, what, eight sevens now? In yeah. Sevens in the, the S58. Like that's getting the job done. Like, you know, I mean, do I think those are going to be six second cars in a year? No. Maybe like three years. I mean, you know, like I said, if you tell somebody no, they're probably going to go out and do it and make it happen. And yeah. it just depends. Like, you know, you, you go back and you think about like, you know, what it took to get, you know, a GTR in the sixes. You know, you had that conversation before and it's like, you know, the, the cubic dollars that was spent to get those cars in the sixes is just, it's crazy. Like, do I think that there's people that can do it in a BMW? Is it possible? Yeah, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but you know, it's a lot. Like there's a big difference between running a 790 and a 690. Like yeah. that's a different animal. And you're definitely going to have to do it with something that's, you're not dropping the kids off at school after you, <laughs> you know, get that one done. But it's a, it's a long while. Like, I mean, you know, I'm sure they're going to, it's going to go quicker, but it's, you know, they're, they're pretty well, pretty well moved into a good space, I would say. But I mean, you know, think about it, like how much stuff actually runs that fast? Mm. Tesla? Come on, man. <laughs> My golf cart hauls ass. It's the only electric Tesla. thing I have. I got a blower Tesla. too. That that works out well. But that's about as far. No, yeah, you're right. You're right. So do you, do you feel like with the, your involvement in your parts, you're kind of like, there's not much more that you can do right now? Oh, no. I mean, I think we're going to continue to move on. I think, you know, they've kind of unlocked the ability to go, you know, rev limiter control. Like, so that's going to be a whole nother aspect of like, what's going to be necessary as those cars start pushing, you know, more RPM when we start seeing nine, 9,500, you know, 10,000 RPM. Yeah. It's like, you know, what's that system going to do on the Valtronic side? Like, mm -hmm. are we going to have to, you know, get in there and basically create something different that maybe we remove it, maybe we can, you know, redesign it. Um, you know, it just depends what they need. It's a different, different port design. So, I mean, I, I think we're in a good spot right now. Um, you know, obviously we're, you know, six, seven months into, producing parts for them so it's it's one of those things that like yeah i think we're in a great great place here do mm -hmm. i think we're done absolutely not i mean we're still making you know we came out with a new evo and dsm part you know a couple of weeks ago in r4 profile basically because a lot of the evo guys are like we want to run 200 miles an hour and like if we're going to do this we need the rpm and we got to get into the 12,000s. and i'm like guys you know that that's a different animal like that's a different profile in order to get you know a type 2 system to go that far mm-hmm and I'm like, let's do it. So, you know, if you look at the the seven second list of Evos, I mean, I mean, I won't even, I haven't looked recently, but I want to say at least the three, four, five top are all running GSE parts in there. So, you know, when they say, hey, well, we want to do this. And I'm like, hey, if, if y'all want to do it, let's go. This episode of the Street Apple Podcast is brought to you by Race Motive. Bring your car from the streets to the track at Race Motor Racing Events in 2024. From Pocono Raceway, Maryland International Raceway, New Jersey Motorsports Park, and new this year, Maple Grove Raceway, Race Motive brings you top tier roll racing events. Their Olympic style grading system ensures precise measurements for fair competition. From the high friction NASCAR surface at Pocono to fully prepped drag trips, every race promises excitement and fairness. So bring yourself and your car and use Street Alpha Pod for 10% off all tickets, whether you spectate or race at racemotive.com. Don't miss your chance to race with the best. Yeah. Before that, with the BMW stuff, I have a brand new G80 S58 motor, of course, right? And I want to make 1200 horsepower, right? What are you going to recommend to me as far as the camshaft goes? I'm going to put an S2 cam in it. Like S2 a, cam. Yeah. I mean, a 74 millimeter turbo, 70 
six like s2 profile like it's it's done great like it's one of those things that is simple um you know it still works with with all of the valve tronic and the the vano stuff i mean mm -hmm. it can be you know you don't have to lock stuff out it's still totally usable it's totally drivable like you're you're not really going to reduce throttle response or anything um you know it's going to put a smile on your face and it's going to pick up and you're going to have you know 1200 horsepower car that's going to run in the eights and you know you're dropping the kids off at school and busting somebody's ass on the way out what other things can you do to the valve train to kind of increase performance i mean obviously when anytime you're turning the boost up you're going to need to have more spring pressure probably than the oem had in mind especially okay. when we start talking about like you know doubling the amount of pressure yeah you know a lot of people think about oh like they you know years ago when when turbo started being a lot more efficient and really a lot more stable at higher boost pressure you know back in the day it was like oh you made 30 36 pounds like that you know 30 maybe you touched 40 and that was like oh now it's like you know a lot of our faster stuff is like oh i need to run you know 90 pounds of boost or 100 pounds of boost <laughs> you know we do that on white rice and it's like yeah we're 12,000 rpms 90 pounds 100 pounds of boost and it's like 100 pounds of boost hey man Take some, take, gotta turn it up. Hundred pounds of boost. Gotta, gotta take it. Gotta turn it up to go to go fours and uh, four hundred three and eighth. With what motor? A two J. Hundred pounds of boost on a two J. Sounds like crazy. Why? Hundred pounds. The most I've heard was Billy's GTR. I think he was like ninety psi. I mean that's good. Thirty eight. I mean a VR thirty eight at ninety pounds of boost is a hell of a lot. Like that's a big valve. You sling a 37, 38 millimeter valve on the intake side. That's a lot of pressure. It might you have know. been, maybe it was 70. I might be wrong. No, he said I, it, it I, was 70, but I think at, on full kill, I think at, um, there's a few people that have, you know, you know, have said that they've pushed it that hard. And then the second part was like, it's like, how did it work out that hard? And, uh, you know, that didn't work out too good. Was, we're breaking a lot of parts. 70 so. pounds is crazy though. But I mean, that's just a restriction of air that's not getting the motor. Right, so, right, right, you know. right. Right. But you got to have you got to have a lot of stuff on on both sides to make that work. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's kind of one of the things, you know, we we get into platforms and stuff like, you know, kind of what what White Rice is, what, you know, Dewey and Eric have kind of put together is a is a super consistent, you know, sport compact car that goes and runs X275 and is, you know, a class holder, you know, record holder and and is consistent like you know it's not a one hit wonder i mean you can almost go out there and bracket race the thing in the four ones so like you know that doesn't that doesn't happen without a, a lot of uh dedicated people behind it mm -hmm. um you know from Kristen tuning and you know engine builders and you know it's head guys it's just you know we've we've developed a lot of parts for that car that luckily like you know do make it into the into the the big picture for other people because you know we can't develop springs and say hey we're gonna we need to make like you know 24 of these springs and that's that's all we need because we need yeah. it for this one project or whatever so it's like you know luckily we do stuff with that platform and it really trickles down into the entire 2j right so um we we kind of went off topic of the bmw you stuff you gotta go back <laughs> to this bmw but you took yeah, the motor I have to out have a section of it i have to have a whole all right let's go for it so you said the s2 cam right I really think that's probably going to be my favorite. I don't think, I think the R, the S3 is going to be in a lot of uh, cars, especially as the, the RPM limit's gone up. Like we're mm -hmm. going to take advantage of being able to have a longer duration. I mean, we're limited, super, we're basically limited on what we can do with lift in that platform because of constraints in the cylinder head. I mean, where we're at on on the, the Valvetronic lever arm is is limiting. Like, you know, you're going to see 11, you know, 10, 10.2 millimeters of lift, like without redesigning that unit, like we're kind of stuck there. And I'm not saying it's not impossible, but it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a big hurdle to get over. And is it totally necessary? I mean, I mean, they're going as fast as they are now. They're making plenty of jam. I mean, we're maxing out turbos left and right, you know, with hmm. efficiency on the head. So like, you know, for the right now we're, we're doing okay. Um, now what about if you're not going for 1200 horsepower? Let's so we've got a smaller profile, okay. you know, and it's, uh, it's definitely one of those, one of the things that we've, we've created saying like, Hey, you know, we, we obviously always get a great foundation of like, Hey, this is an OEM. And usually if somebody's modifying it, usually the OEM like baseline 
is usually pretty decent. You know, at least it has been in the last 10, 15 years of cars coming out. You know, mm -hmm. cars have gotten so much more efficient. It's not like they're putting out, I mean, stock, they're making 500. Like it's an inline six, three liter and it's yeah. making that. So it's kind of like, yeah, they're already getting the job done pretty well. So it's like, you got a good baseline to work from. Okay. Um, so there's a bridgeable gap there. It's just a matter of like, where does it fit in? And it, it's going to fit into like, you know, your street car guys, it's going to fit into your road race guys, you know, drifting potentially where you really want that lightning fast throttle response. Um, okay. so is it going to be like, Hey, I want to make a thousand like, yeah, I think it'll probably get right up to it. But like, that's, that's going to be, it's going to be a stretch. Um, so that's like I said, I mean, most of the guys that are in the, in the engines already, and you know, a lot of them are pushing a thousand, like, I mean, for the most yeah, part, yeah, easily, they're yeah. super easy to, they're super manageable, right? It's not a huge ordeal to make a grand with a thing. Like, <laughs> which is kind of wild. I mean, I remember when a thousand was like, oh, like, I want to make a thousand. Like, oh, everything's got out of it. Now it's like, you make a thousand, like, okay. It's like, I know it's too easy. I, I, uh, I blame the turbo. I also blame the turbo people for creating these turbos that, you know. You blame the turbo. Hey, man. Making a, you, you got a turbo that can make, can be stable at 50, 60, 70 pounds of boost on a 74, 76 millimeter frame turbo. Like, that means, that causes a whole nother level of like valve train instability issues that I have to deal with. You know, hey, why am I floating valve trains if I'm making 70 pounds mm. of boost? And it's like, yeah, it's, you know pounds per square inch man like where do you think that where do you think that pressure is at you think it's on the inside or you think it's on the outside of the valve pushing down and trying to open it as well but for a while wasn't there a point where it was like your it's like, limitations right like yeah. how easy is it now to get a five axis cnc machine 20 years ago it was a pain in the butt like they were casting the wheels and now it's okay. like they're able to shape right. the wheels and do that kind of stuff so it's like you know it's it's natural like yeah you know people wanted more they wanted to push them harder you know they're class limitations and it's like hey we're going to put a limitation on the diameter of the wheel because that's the easiest thing for us to check mm -hmm. well yeah they can check it but it's like well let's see like how do we how do we pack more air into this yeah. you know 80 millimeter hole <laughs> like how do we get it to pull in more so it, it's it's the nature of the beast i mean we'll we'll keep playing it i mean unfortunately you know spring spring technology is is uh, or at least valve spring technology is is definitely the kind of the Achilles heel of the valve train. So mm -hmm. it's the first thing that that we have to deal with as far as you know what we're allowed to where we're allowed to go. Okay. You know, if I can't keep the valve against or you know whatever mating components against the lobe, like mm -hmm. I'm wasting time. Right. Right. So is it better to have like a like you guys have a conical spring, right? Sure. So is it better to have something like that as opposed to like a dual spring? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing sexy about valve springs, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to, it's like the, you know, you just don't want to buy it. It's like, wait, how much do I have to spend on these? And it's yeah. like, yeah, well, this is going to save your ass. So you have to buy this. This is the safety equipment. But yeah, I mean, it's all about lightweight components, but we still have to be able to have enough pressure to keep, keep things closed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, a conical spring has a lot of the dual benefits, but without the weight, um, without the extra friction that's involved in dampening a dual spring. So, you know, and it's, it's usually a lot more difficult to put in, um, as far as a dual spring, like you can screw it up. Like, you know, you don't get the seat just right. It's sitting on a ledge and you've reduced the amount of install height. Whereas, you know, a conical is usually going to be a, an easier thing to put in. So the end customer, you know, it makes it easier for them. Yeah. Uh, the downside is, is like manufacturing it and, and getting it to be in the package that, that works is the, is the tricky part. So, you know, we can't always use them. I can't put one in the B58 because I just don't have the room or the S58 right. or the Lambo. So it's just, you know, packaging becomes an issue. Right. Um, but in the places we can run them, I mean, we run them, uh, you know, the Coyote is, you know, we've made three new kits for that, you know, for whether it be the Gen 1, 2 or the Gen 3. I mean, I think mm -hmm. we're coming out with a fourth one, more of a high pressure option for a lot of the turbo guys that are really going to be swinging for stuff. So um, if if I have the option, like um, that's the direction we go in without a doubt. All right. So talk to me about these uh, these F-150 or Coyote cams that you have over here. There's limitations to the OEM cams. I mean, OEM cams are always kind of designed for a certain rpm band like the truck cams for instance like they're they're really more you know and it includes like the firing order like they've changed that for the mustang on them mm -hmm. so you know they're more tailoring that specific setup for you know i wouldn't want to say like 
hauling or pulling, but like really more low speed grunt work. Right. Um, and you know, obviously as we do stuff like throw a supercharger on it, like you're changing the dynamics of the engine, but you know, if you start revving that, that really kind of spicy cam that the OEM has for this little bitty rev range, like, and you push that higher in the RPM band, you really start to end up with an, an unstable valve train. You, know, you start doing things like floating valves. You're starting to, you know, pressurize har- your, your hydraulic lifters differently. Like it's mm-hmm. just, you know, it's not the animal that it needs to be to be done right and kind of more reliably. Right. I know that's hard to understand and like, hey, I want to double the power in my Coyote engine. And then, you know, oh, it's going to be reliable, right? And it's like, well, what's your definition of reliable? Like <laughs> you doubled the power on it. So like you're, you're taking away from that reliability curve. Like, is it still reliable? Yeah, but you're, you are reducing that. So, mm-hmm. you know, putting the right parts in there and making it kind of more tailored to what you're doing with it is definitely the right way to do it. I mean, I'm, you know, they've definitely maximized a lot of kind of the lift capability of it. Um, at least where you go as far as the kinematic design of, of the rocker arm. Um, and what it can push to yeah. and still not get too much pitch angle and stuff like that. And where you're on the valve, like all that stuff makes a difference. So yeah, they've, they've pushed hard on it. Um, do I think we can improve it? Absolutely. You know, there's things that we don't have to, to really worry about as much, you know, like we kind of said earlier, you know, the OEMs are doing things to, to maximize certain, certain rev range, certain RPM where people are, are driving. And I mean, mm-hmm. I bet you, if you look at, you know, ECU logs on an OEM car, like, you know, the typical car guy is going to wrap the thing out constantly, but yeah, you know, for yeah. the most part, they're not really designing for that subset of car guys. So. Right. Right. So at the, the, these cams are different than the uh, Mustang ones, right? Yeah. Just the firing order for, for the most part, like the shaft is relatively the same. So like the lobe placement, the orientation that it's at on, mm-hmm. on some cylinders is different. So what have you done to, to improve on what the OEM has already created? So, I mean, the OEM uses an assembled camshaft with it, um, you know, which is already a light, a light camshaft. Right. Um, you know, obviously their, their lobe profile set is uh, tailored towards that, mm-hmm. that, kind of rev range and where it's working. You know, we've gone in and we've basically said like, hey, you know, we're we're people that like boost. So we're gonna make sure that we, you know, understand that for the very first, right when you get going, like we're planning on people to be putting superchargers on them. We're planning for people to run turbos on them, or, you know, maybe they're using, you know, some nitro methane mix and <laughs> running it in A. And I mean, you know, the cars make fantastic power even just doing those simple things to yeah. it. So, you know, it's it's you know like i said i cut my teeth on a type 2 system like that's what we know and what we do like i mean we'll uh we'll give it a go and i think we'll uh probably make some real believers out of a lot of people what are the differences between uh na cam and a boosted profile cam? so we talked about valve spring like what we you know in an na format we're not we're not as worried about the amount of, we can run a reduced pressure spring, right? We don't have to have as much pressure because we don't have to worry about the valve having, you know, 40, 50 pounds of pressure behind it, whether it be on the intake or the exhaust. Yeah. You know, we, d- we can manage uh, lighter weight components in, in the spring and be able to rev more. So, you know, obviously if it's an NA and they're, they're, they're needing to cycle the engine more because we have to basically cycle it higher to really get a lot more volumetric efficiency through it, right? Again, we're going back to the air pump thing. So like, we're gonna shift the power band out of where that original target was. Um, how are we managing that? Like, we still need to, to keep under wraps really what, what the customer's doing with it. Like, how high are they going? So like, we're gonna, again, we're gonna tailor RPM bands to that specific need. Um, in the profile, there's, you know, we don't have to, we can be a little bit faster on the seat to seat stuff because we don't have that act, added pressure behind the valve. So it's, mm-hmm. it, it's easier to shut it. Um, right. so, you know, there's, there's, I don't want to say we can be more aggressive with it, but we kind of can be more aggressive with it. Oh. Uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the turbo stuff, like you're, you're balancing, you know, stresses and, and really, you know, what we can do inside of the packaging. Right. Right. Um, whether it be the spring, what is available, how much boost is running, how big the valves are, like, you know, all this stuff comes into play. Okay. So on the boosted side, right? Since you guys mo- primarily focus more on boosted applications for the F-150, right? Um, what, what type of cam should I be looking at for F-150? You know, we're not going to go crazy on lift. We're talking Gen 3 stuff. Yeah. 
Um, so you're you're probably going to be in like the, you know, 560, 570, 570 thou worth of lift. Um, we're not going to be much higher than that. Um, we're going to run probably in like a 240s as far as duration. Okay. Um, and, you know, basically what we're going to end up with is, you know, outside of what you're going to see on paper is like, we're going to be a little bit nicer on the ramp so that it's going to set down a little bit easier. We're going to have a more stable valve train for that, you know, that punch and, and how fast it's going to much faster. It's going to rev through the RPM band than what was originally designed for. So mm-hmm. we have to, you know, like I said, we have to take a lot of that into respect. So, you know, what I'm getting at is like, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And like a lot of people look at something and say like, Oh, I want the biggest, give me the biggest thing you got. Like, well, is that, you know, a lot of times you're wasting time. Like people don't think about the fact, especially with a type two system is like, you know, you've, you've got something that's not, you've got a spring that's limiting, right? Like it can only do so much with it, but you've also got the rocker arm, the stamp steel rocker arm. Like that thing's going to deflect if you're way too aggressive on it. And that's, that's a lot of the balancing that we know and understand. And, and that's what comes into play. Like you just, you have to be able to tailor it correctly. So it's not always like, Hey, I gotta, you know, get the biggest thing out there. If somebody else makes one that's bigger, I need to go to that one. Like, Hmm. Did they just throw some numbers at it or was mm-hmm. it really like, did they take the deep dive and go into the full aspect of it? Yeah. Okay. So what, what are people running right now? Like if like these guys who are running crazy horsepower in these, I don't even know what the highest horsepower uh, F1. I mean, is you've right. got, I mean, honestly in the coyote world, like you've, you've pushed it into the 3000. Like, I mean, there's, there's plenty of, there's plenty of power potential because of the cubic inches. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's a yeah. bigger motor. I mean, you know, it's almost two times the size of a RB26. Right. Or it is two times the size of an RB26 stock. Does anything change though? In certain, because of the, because of the, like the displacement, does that make it easier for you? To I mean, of- just think about like, you know, you've got more cylinders. It's kind of like the V10. There's more cylinders. There's more going on. A lot of people think like, oh, I need this much because this is what I did in a Honda or, or you know, there's two of them. So yeah. I need to make sure and have, you know, a 270 degree duration profile because this is what works and like it's not necessarily the case um okay it can be it can be tricky to understand and and tricky to to play with i mean a lot of it comes down to like what what works what what a reputation is for a company and mm-hmm. like you know ultimately the proof's in the pudding when you kind of put it in and run them right um and that's where you see the stuff that kind of goes on behind because it's it's there's more magic than just throwing some numbers at it yeah Right. So you mentioned Hondas. Yeah. Do you guys still do Honda stuff? Uh, as little as possible. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I don't have a good way of saying like, I, you know, it's it's an interesting platform. It's, uh, you you know, it, it cut a lot of people's teeth and they still do, you know, you still go to races and it's like, you know, there's a ton of Hondas that still race cars. Um, it's just, it's, it's a lot of old technology. Um, and you know, a lot of it's been changed and moved around, but it's just, you know, it's, it's, you know, the coolest thing I thought that happened with Hondas was all wheel drive systems. Like I'm like, Oh, you know? Yeah. I mean, I remember being at world cup, like, I don't know, probably six, seven years ago. And it was like, you know, it was God awful. Cause it was like, Oh, the here comes Hondas. And it's like, how many Indos or, or oil downs do we have to deal with now? And it's like, now it's got a little bit better. And I mean, it's impressive to see what, you know, you put a drivetrain under that motor and like all of a sudden it's like, I mean, look how many seven second Hondas there are. I mean, six second Hondas. And yeah. it's like, you know, I've never seen anybody change more motors than kind of the Honda guys. Like those guys are like a glutton for punishment at the track. And it's like, yeah, we're putting together one because we got a, you know, three of them that we broke this on. And I'm like, y'all are up all night doing this. Like <laughs> it's, they dedicated them. Dedicated and they're into it. And I, I appreciate that. But, you know, as far as, is is doing parts i mean we're gonna we're gonna launch some some kind of single single roller non vtech stuff kind of to support the the racers but you know when it comes to you know boosted stuff on the factory kind of rocker arm assembly and this it's just it's you know it's old it's it's just it can't take the stresses yeah. that we need to be able to do to run them as hard as they are now i mean it was fine you know making four to six hundred years ago with different oils and stuff that was you know less boost i mean you were making 30 pounds of boost and making six seven eight hundred horsepower and it was a, it, it'd still go through parts but nothing like what it does now right right yeah you know, i mean we do a lot of stuff with miles kerr and it's kind of like you know i keep 
giving him crap and I, mean, I tried to get him to buy every platform that we were working on i even asked him to put a k-series in it i was like just put a k-series in it it's got a roller like we can have some fun with it i was like i'll come out with cams if you do that yeah and he's like nah he's like i'm a b b series guy and i was like uh so that's crazy I, I i wonder how much more you can push that platform though like i mean you know that i think that you know there's some interesting stuff i mean uh four pistons coming out with a a mm. cast head i mean I, I i feel like the limitations to a lot of the older 90s I mean, that's 80s, 90s, early 2000s cars is going to be like the OEM parts that are required, the cylinder heads, the blocks, you know, the you know, that's one of the issues we have with the B series. It's like you can't buy an OEM set of rocker arms. So basically you're living off of like maybe Ooh. somebody's 250,000 mile set of rocker arms. And yeah. it's like, you know, these things have been beat to crap and back by grandma who didn't change her oil. And you're like, yeah, I got a brand new set from somebody out of a junkyard, but. You know, it's, it's, you know, they got cylinder heads, like they're working on this. Obviously we've got billet blocks and a lot of this stuff now. So, I mean, I think as the industry kind of moves away from having to rely on OEMs for those mm -hmm. hard parts, like I think you open up a new kind of channel for being like, hey, you know, it's a lot more simple platform than say a BMW. Yeah. You know, yeah, you can go down to the dealer and buy any part for your BMW. You know, you walk into the dealer, buy Honda parts. And I mean, half the time, like, yeah, that's discontinued. Yeah. What are you talking about? You know, it's just it depends what's being supportive. I mean, luckily, there's a lot of them. So we'll see if it kind of goes to the next level. I mean, if there is a next level, I mean, like I said, they're running sixes. Like, that's a that's a testament right there. Yeah, they are. Yeah. There's not yeah. a lot of them, but like it's getting the job done. I think the seven second class there is pretty impressive. Do you have any, so just Miles, Miles Car is the only one that you Miles have. is one of the, yeah. I mean, he's got, you know, full GSE valve train and cams in there. And like I said, he, you know, drives the thing to Starbucks and <laughs> still races it. But he's so diligent about, you know, maintenance on it. I mean, obviously he's at a shop and has the ability to do it. Right, it's right. like, you know, he'll send pictures and be like, hey, what do you think of this? And I'm like, uh, and it's like, oh, I'm going to send you this cam back to look at. I mean, I, you know, he's probably used the same two or three sets of cams for the last six or seven years, you know? And it's just cause he's, he's on top of it. I mean, he's gone through and had rockers redone and, you know, we've tried polishing stuff and doing things for him just to try to help, you know, make it live longer, so to speak. But yeah. like everybody thinks he's nuts that he's out there still running VTEC and I, I'm right there with him. Like, I'm just like, Hey dude, let's put some rollers in this thing and let's go. Yeah. I don't wanna, you know, I gotta drive to Starbucks. Need that low cam for that. Oh my God, Miles. <laughs> it's funny, you know, people that have, uh, people in the industry that, that have impacts uh, on manufacturers are really a great thing. And it kind of, you know, keeps us, keep us grounded and, you know, keeps the spirit into, into the performance game, right? Yeah. Like if you didn't have people that had that much passion for it, like would we even bother? Like probably not. Yeah. You know, you got to have somebody that wants it and wants to do something or like it's got to be exciting. Like I said, I mean, even the side by side guys like 14,000 RPMs and 50, 60 pounds of boost is like, oh, let's see if we can make this live like this ought to be fun. Right. Right. So. So Honda's basically with those days are kind of you just have your specific people that you work with. Yeah. And I mean, we still have a catalog of parts to 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 offer them. It's just not as uh, high on the list of getting things done. Well, shout out to Miles. I yeah. interviewed him last year at World Cup. It was pretty <laughs> cool. And I was like uh, super hectic um, at that event because I was interviewing people outside and it was just loud and just like two stepping in the background. Were you, was that in the, uh, the tent with Speed Factory? Yes. Yeah. How many motors were they on changing over when you were doing <laughs> that interview? Had, I felt bad because I was like, it was my first time there and I was like, damn, I hope I, I hope I didn't have any involvement in that because I think when I was setting up, they went out through a pass and he blew up. And they were like in there working on stuff. So then I was like, damn, like, I hope I wasn't like in the way. Hope I didn't have any. No, it's okay. That. Because like after that next pass, they might've done it again and it had to be. Yeah, I think so, it like, did blow up again. Hey man, that's, that's a yeah. six second car. Like they got it. They're at the top of that list. And like it, again, there's passion there, like to get it done. And like, you know, you got to respect it no matter what. No, you have to. And I, I, my first car was a Honda too. So like, um, that was how I got my kind of start in cars was Hondas. So it's pretty cool to see those guys still pushing that platform. Um, with motors that I wish I had back then when I was younger. So it's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. I mean, can we talk about some Lamborghini stuff? Yeah, man. Lamb Lamborghini. Lamber. Lamber. Um, do you know if they're running any type of special cams? Are they running stock Some cams? are. Uh, for the most part, yeah. We've done a few things. Like some, we've got a few 
prototype sets out, but okay. that's about as far as we've gone there. We've done the valve train stuff, trying to help stabilize that. Like they've definitely ran into some hurdles with uh, certain platforms and trying to figure that out. Um, you know, we've we've just released kind of valves just to support it because there wasn't really somebody that actually made valves directly for the 5.2. They were kind of carryovers. Okay. So we wanted to make something that was actually correctly fit for it. Um, so we did that. And then, like I said, you know, it's a it's an awesome motor. It's really a it's it's another one of those platforms. Like I I I made Lucas English take me for a ride in his when we were in uh, I guess it was two years ago in Houston at Texas 2K and it's you know fourteen hundred horse stock long block you know turbos transmission some maybe a clutch and Motex and tires and I swear to God that probably was one of the fastest cars I've ever felt on the highway like it just my stomach was in the back seat and i was like holy crap this is awesome and he's like i was like and it stops and it turns and it does it just checks all the boxes and i'm like this thing is badass <laughs> like why didn't they just make it like this from the factory which i guess now apparently they dropped to a v8 and put a hybrid system on mm -hmm. turbos so yeah they kind of went down that road but yeah i mean the v10 is it's an awesome motor i mean it's you know it's it's in a uh, i think probably one of the nicest oem profiles that i've ever seen was would either be a would either be one of the gt3 rs r cup engines but that's not really it's more of a race car or yeah. the performante like the profile that's in the evo and the performante and the sto is like i was like wow this is actually really nice like is it have limitations absolutely when you start pounding boost to it but like as far as a well-designed uh kind of engine and setup and that's kind of why they've been able to really push it where they have like yeah and they're really not leaning on it that hard i mean again you're you're splitting up that amount of torque over all those cylinders and you know at least in the head it, it just works differently so you're not straining it as hard so like the idea of having a 25 well that's a little bit far fetched but <laughs> you know a 1500 horsepower engine is like i mean it's almost like the thing's not even breaking a sweat to do it yeah and uh you know i think that they, they actually made a ton of them too like there's so many of them it's surprising they made more r8s and, and lamborghini huracans and they did um gtrs like through the production years and it's wow. like that's impressive now i mean if i had a you know huracan am i gonna go and you know slap turbos on it and tear it apart no i'm probably gonna walk by in the garage and be like yeah, that looks sick yeah yeah but uh you know there's definitely a side of me that says like that's the baddest car i've probably ever ridden in so you know i i automatically respect it and like i'm i'm enjoying uh kind of learning more about the platform, you mm -hmm. know, where the hurdles are, what it, what it's going to take to kind of get it, you know, to be a more reliable, you know, 1500, 2000 horsepower car. What are some of the hurdles that you guys uh... see in it? Man, I'll tell you right now, the, the, the cylinder head's pretty decent. Like I said, there's definitely some, some issues with some rockers, um, especially on the cars that are really kind of turned up, um, you know, at least on the OEM profile stuff, you know, some of it we can kind of help tailor, like obviously with springs and, and kind of help bring in some of that into, you know, into check, we can definitely improve upon it and yeah. have, um, you know, I think a lot of the tougher stuff really becomes down to, you know, building blocks and, and, you know, ring packs have been kind of an issue for them. That's definitely out of our scope, but like, obviously I've, I've heard that, um, you know, the Sissio has been in a lot of them I mean, the guys at, at T1 and, you know, AMS, obviously, you know, they're all there. And of, of course, you know, you can't deny underground racing. I mean, they're kind of the ones that yeah, yeah. I would say they pioneered broke the record that. too. Half you mile know. record, standing half mile record. Do you have any involvement in that? Not at all. They're in Charlotte. <laughs> We're in South Carolina. I don't know. You, you could be running your cams. Nope. That'd be just about impossible at this point. <laughs> what do you mean? There's not that many out there. So you, uh, the only one that's got them would be a Sissio. So we'll Sissio. see what happens in the future. But yeah, no, Sissio, he just thought, he just posted earlier that he had um made 2400 on one of the R8s, something like that, the black one. Yeah, they, they've, uh, you know, he's he's a, a testament to somebody with passion in, oh, in the 100%. industry. You know, yeah. he's uh, he's an interesting cat and, you know, he cares a lot. And I've I've honestly watched him you know, we were manufacturing stuff already and, and doing stuff as he kind of got into it. And it's, you know, he's got a lot of energy and he's, uh, yeah, 
he did mention that on this podcast actually that he was that he was working with some uh some cam shafts they were they're doing some stuff with some cam shafts and stuff like that yeah he did say that yeah, he's the one that said you know i was like how long does it take to r and r that motor to put this in and he's like yeah 40 plus hours and i'm like you're gonna uh huh it's like that's not a lot of so i can't screw up is what you're saying you're not going to do this more than once so that's kind of the the idea but yeah i mean they you know he's always willing it doesn't matter even in the gtr platform you know they've they've been a great partner through the years as far as you know giving us feedback as far as what what they're doing as as the cars progress making sure that you know they have reliable packages for their customers and you know he's done things and and warrantied stuff for for in customers that i'm like you know, these are race cars and he's like yeah but you know we're selling like that's what we're we're selling it to do what it's doing and we need to make sure and make it make it last so Damn. it's definitely been one of the things that you know i respect that like, yeah that's somebody that stands behind what they produce and like that's a huge thing in this this industry right so right. and i mean you know he's got what three i guess shops and now they're doing a lot more of the engine uh machining and, and yeah. stuff in-house so like you know they you know he's he's definitely going in the right right direction with it so so we will be seeing some some camshafts in the future for v10 platform oh for sure probably pretty soon actually pretty soon and um sissy will be announcing this or i mean it will it'll be everywhere but yeah okay yeah all right yeah i know some guys who have v10s um and they're looking for something that you know i guess there, there's been a few people that have uh, definitely helped us along the way as far as some information so you know there's a lot of people that are kind of chomping at the bit and you know it's just a matter of you know making sure we're happy i mean those things are expensive and we definitely we don't take a we don't take it lightly when we develop stuff like we don't want to we don't want it to be just quick, simple, throw something at it and it not work. Like, it, yeah. you know, when it hits the market, like it's, it's ready to go. Like, you, you know, there's, there's nobody that's going to get a, an email and say, Hey, you need to finish machining this when you get it. Like it's, it's done and it's going to work and you know, you're, you're going to install it and you know, it's going to, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. So why do all the fastest cars run GSC? Cause it's the, the best. Cars? You know, it's it's a dedication from a lot of people that make parts here and design and, you know, making sure that, you know, quality, it doesn't leave here unless it's right. Like, that's what what we believe. And, you know, it's, you know, is it is everything done in the best that it will ever be? Or will the platforms continue to grow and need, you know, more stuff? But like when we're invested in a platform, like we're there. Yeah. Like we're going to keep growing with it. And I think that's what a lot of it is. I mean, I'd. I'd love to lean harder on a lot of the 2J stuff, but like at the point that we're at with, with some of those things, it's like, you know, we're limited by what the cylinder heads can even take. And it's just, until that gets, you know, figured out as far as what the cast material can can handle, like, you know, we might be at, at a point where, you know, 3000 horsepower in a inline six is, is pretty damn good. But I mean, when you start talking pound, you know, horsepower per cubic inch, like we're, we're way up there, man. Yeah. Like, you know, on M1 and stuff like that, I mean, we're, we're pretty well pushing, pushing it. So uh, I'm not saying it's over. Like, I feel like we've got, you know, some ideas and there's definitely some smart people that are mm -hmm. uh, working on some new stuff. And like I said, as, as those things develop, like we're going to be there and we're going to push harder on them. So I think that people know that and why do the fastest ones run it? I mean... You know, I don't know that we have too many of those those records and those RBs that that are going fast right now, but I think uh, we've got some got some shit for them here shortly. For uh, with RBs, really? Yeah, man. Got to remember, like we haven't been, you know, RBs is is somewhat of a four maybe five year into that platform. Okay. So you know, we've got there's a lot of there's a lot of positive projections in it. I mean, I think that the amount of people in the states that have really started taking a notice to them like it's not just the people that are like oh, i want an r32 or 33 for a four and like i'm gonna put it in the garage and like you know i i think you're gonna see that platform you know growing more i think as as you see stuff like cylinder heads and obviously build up blocks like yeah is it gonna be, be an rb26 and a yeah. nissan faction or is it gonna be you know an aftermarket cylinder head a billet block and you know forged cranks and whatever i mean at the end of the day like there's a lot of uh there's definitely a lot more issues with the oem nissan power plant than there is with the toyota okay 
so there's there's definitely some some more improvements that can be made there on the uh, Nissan side of things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, Toyota invented TQM and and quality manufacturing, so to speak. So like when they produced that 2J and 1J and like like they were all about making the best that it could possibly be and not yeah. having it go bad. So like it's kind of why it's able to do what it is. With the Nissan stuff, I know people are starting to get their stuff now. They've been waiting for blocks for like 2 years. And still underheads for two years. Casting's a castings. whole pain and a pain in the butt to deal with. And like yeah. I said, if you don't have a car that's in production, like you know, that's not high on their priority list to service the market. And especially when you start talking about stuff that's, you know, it was done in the early two thousands with that. What two thousand and two, four? I'm even surprised they went this long with it. It's I odd. know it's it's nice that they they looked at it and they weren't just like yeah whatever let's just move on. You know they're still flagship cars for them. Yeah, and I mean the popularity of the VR thirty eight or the the GTR is, you know, it's hugely beneficial, I'm sure, for the for the post stuff. Yeah. Is there a difference between cast and billet cams? Absolutely. What is the biggest difference? Yield strength in the material. Okay. Basically, we can we can do things with a billet cam that we can't do with a cast cam uh, because of basically how brittle it is. Um, we're not really necessarily going to be lighter than a cast cam because of the density of a forged billet cam. Okay. Um, but it allows us to machine it more and have less cross-sectional material. So there's times I think we have probably the lightest RB26 cam. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, because we do stuff like we drill them to reduce weight on it. We don't do that with all of them, but we, you know, that's one of the markets where we, you know, it's a, it's a pretty well sought, you know, pretty well defined market. And right. I was like, we need to do something that's going to be a little bit different. So like, obviously, you know, there's so many similarities with a 2J and I was like, you know, this, this is a fun platform. And I'll be honest, I had a friend of mine that got an RB26 imported and probably, I don't even want to know, 2010 or 11. And it was like, you know, stock bottom end, six, 700 horse, like nothing crazy, but it was, you know, just the gear ratio in that car and launching it on the street was like, this is awesome. And so it's always had a, you know, special place in my heart. I mean, yeah. I'd love to say like, yeah, I want one and I need one, but God almighty, have they gotten expensive. So, uh, yeah, yeah that's super expensive. I got a model of one. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I'll keep that. <laughs> so when do you recommend somebody runs a cat, uh, a billet cam? I mean, at this day and age, like we're able to take surface finishes and stuff further with the billet stuff than the cast. Like we okay. don't have to rely on, you know, it's like we control the destiny when it comes to the blank. We're not taking a, a predefined blank and putting a low profile on it. So obviously, like having that control as a manufacturer is huge. You know, not having to worry about uh, torsional twist on it or, you know, the cam snapping when you're installing it is huge. But, you know, the, I guess the only. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's trust me, I've had plenty of customers when we had cast cams like, hey, your cam broke. And it's like, yeah what were you doing? And he's like, well, it just snapped. It's like, it's probably because you put it in the head and tightened it down wrong. And then it snapped. Like you do that on a billet cam, you're probably going to screw up the aluminum pretty good. Right. Right. Um, so like that, that's obviously a benefit in, in that respect. Um, but as far as like what we're able to do, like we're able to lean on profile stresses. It's, it'll take more, It'll take more aggression and it'll take more stresses so we can do stuff like we can be harder on the valve train okay. when it applies um, or is al we're allowed to um, and it's more manageable. Like the, we can do stuff on our blank that we couldn't do on a cast one that would just erode a cast one. Uh, and that's kind of the, the biggest benefits to it. I, I always because I, I remember people were talking crap about billet stuff, you know, billet. Oh, why? Well, you don't need to run billet cams. You can run this. You can run that. But like, is it more of just like... Um, like just having the flexibility to do more with it. Yeah, I mean, it's you're always going to reach a point where like when you start talking about the really high horsepower stuff, yeah. like they'll find the end of it and they'll be like, you know, I've had plenty of conversations like, yeah, you know, these will work great, but, you know, we've definitely found the end of what it is. But, you know, that that occurs plenty fast on a on a cast. I mean, like I said, we can we can definitely be a lot. It's a lot more aggressive in certain ways like this. It'll take more stress because it's it's a denser, it's a harder, it's a it's a better material, right? It's cleaner. There's not holes in it. I mean, uh, the downside to a cast cam is like, 
you know, nobody thinks about the fact that it's pouring a mold and like there can be air bubbles when you're grinding it that are subsurface. Right. So like you don't even know they exist from from looking at them after you've ground it. But like, you know, there it is, maybe two microns under the surface. And as it runs, it'll just create a hole or worse yet, if you're grinding a profile and you're grinding it and you find a hole in it and like there's a big old, you know, spot in it. And it's like, well, there goes that thing in the trash can because, well. It's got a big old hole in it and there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. So now do you have to have a certain like let's say if I wanted to run a billet cam on like say an RB, do I have to have like DLC coded buckets? Uh, that's kind of like a false idea that that's a requirement. You know, really it's about surface finish more than than uh than a hard coating on top. And a lot of times, you know, getting that hard coating of a DLC to to correctly adhere to a bucket surface is it's kind of the problem. So like we almost don't want people to do that. I'd rather have a, a polished bucket. I mean, it's it, there's no benefit to it other than there's more downside potential. Um, you know, that's there's also a lot of D DLC is really like a it's a very broad subject. Like you could have there's hundreds of different varieties. There's hydrogenated, there's non hydrogenated, there's, you know, uh, they do different things like it's different kind of coatings there's different things and how it's adhered and what it's used for like yeah. is it just a hard surface or is it filling in the valleys in in a subsurface so that it's making it smoother is that a good thing or a bad thing i mean is it making a positive on a surface versus a negative void where we can trap things like oil in um on a microscopic level right you know? and you know to me like i said you know some of the sometimes when it's done right yeah it can be an awesome awesome benefit that it really allows you to have a super slick surface and it can be a benefit because yeah. it's almost like it doesn't require as much oil. It keeps friction down. It keeps less heat in it. But again, like when you're flaking off of carbon basically in your engine, because it's not adhering right, like that's not good. <laughs> yeah. You can tend to tear up some stuff along the way. And, right. and that's kind of the, the bad side. And unfortunately, like we've seen a lot of people that have you know, touted like, hey, this is fix everything. And it's really not that case. Like, you know, this the surface finish being better is is the real gain to it of okay. anything. Is it required? Absolutely not. I mean, all of our cams that we have that are flat tap, it can run on almost all of the OEM yeah. kind of grade material stuff. I mean, there's no requirement there at all. And you don't run into issues with, because I'm assuming if you're running a billet style cam, like it's going to be harder, right? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we are, technically on the surface harder than what a but i mean that's just a you know that's that's just a, a wear property right i mean you could have diamonds on your lobe it would be extremely hard but it's it's not necessarily going to hurt anything as long as it's correctly manufactured and smooth it won't wear the buckets or anything like that i mean it, if it was made out of diamonds it might cut it if it was wrong right. but you know for the most part it's like how hard can it be i mean the harder it is the better but you can't have it too hard that it's brittle so okay. it's it's again it's like you know it's kind of a false statement but you know it's there's really not a too hard situation like steel is steel like you're not going to get it to the point where it's like oh my god it's gonna cut everything apart yeah that was just like a thing where it's like if you have a billet stock if you have a that's hard just bad information that gets passed around and then it becomes gospel and it's just wrong interesting well i'm glad you cleared it up well that's what we're here <laughs> for sometimes all right so do all do all of uh, like i guess can manufacturers have the same equipment that you have here no I mean, in our space, absolutely not. There's probably maybe two, one, maybe one or two in the States. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely different. I mean, as far as, you know, the idea or what we do is we, we really take the OEM guidelines. I mean, we, we do some work for them as far as what they require. And, and you know, we, we get the ability or get the benefit of, like, a lot of our materials getting tested, you know, through their rigorous testing when they're doing R&D. And, like, that's been a... A real eye-opening thing because you know it's a lot of our material that's used i mean we had a material that was our materials that we use our processes that were used for an oem test and they they had two different cams that were made in pre-production this is you know early on in the r d phase before right. they're really like going you know sub 200 sets they get run and and they're doing things in engine dynos like you know 2000 hour idle test, 200 hour peak hold torque test, like all of those things. And they're using our materials. Uh, and, you know, we're getting to, to 
the benefit of understanding what's what it's capable of what it's doing and and you know it's like i had a conversation with one of the engineers because they're like look we had a different manufacturer that made you know the the net, a different set yeah. and we ran it and like they had a failure and yours didn't like what's your opinion on why and i was like oh it could be a few things and like after talking back and forth it's like you know really it has to do with the material that we're using versus what they used and you know unfortunately they were like well that's not good because we we can't mimic your material grade and the oem like on the oem production piece because it would be too expensive mm. so it's like it's like kind of like we shot ourselves a little bit in the foot on that but it's you know it's a learning thing and at the end of the day it's like well is that a bad thing and like no we know now we know a limit yeah so right we know where we don't wouldn't want to use an 8620 core or, or you know a 5100 series core or something like that right 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 so with that being said, since you guys are always kind of innovating new, you know, new parts and stuff like that, how do you guys deal with people who, I guess, copy your parts? Boy, that's fuel to the fire. That means it's time to go back to the drawing board and push it to the next <laughs> level, right? Like if somebody has ripped it off and they're going to use it as, as their own and sell it against you, like, you know, you better be able to take it to the next level. You know, you can't stop them. I mean, anybody can buy our product. Like I can't stop somebody from doing that. Yeah. And if I focus on it, like, is it really going to help anything? Like, what are they going to do? Stop doing it? I can't really patent a load profile set. So, you know, yeah, if we do some stuff and rock our arms or change something, we absolutely can, you know, patent those kind of things. But, you know, how to deal with somebody who's copying your part, you know, if you came up with it, you automatically, you know, there's always something that you can improve, right? I mean, I always think that way. It's like, it's never it's never the best right you know in my eyes i mean my bar is probably pretty high it's never you know you almost never get to it but you know if somebody's going to rip it off and copy me that means i got to go i got to push it to the next level so, so has that been your kind of model for like the past how, i don't know how many years <laughs> yeah pretty much i mean that's just i just i don't you can't focus on the fact that I mean, you know, half the industry gets ripped off and it gets made overseas and it's like, yeah, here it looks pretty. It's in a shiny box and like here. Yeah, it's the same stuff. Yeah, the profile number is the same. Just buy ours. It's like, no, it's not. But that doesn't, that doesn't bother you that like you're spending all this time doing all the R&D behind the stuff and then people are just taking that and then going to China, making it themselves or whatever and then selling it and... I mean, I could call people and yell at them and scream out on the phone, but like, what's the point? Like that just wastes the energy. Like I'd rather put it towards, you know, working on, on the next thing. I mean, they're never going to do it quite as, they're never going to do it as well as we do. Right. I mean, we care too much at the end of the day. Like, yeah, somebody can rip it off. Like, Hey, they're taking a part that they're going to copy and they're going to basically rip a profile and they're going to put it on whatever, whether it be a makeshift billet blank or a, mm -hmm. you know, cast variant. And then that, that's what they're going to do. And they're probably going to have it made in a sweatshop that doesn't care. And who knows if it's actually even phased correctly or whatever. So like at the end of the day, do I think it's the same level of quality of product? Absolutely not. Mm. So are you getting the same thing? No, no, you're not. Um, so what's next for you, man? Like what, what are your, what are your plans for this coming year? I mean, honestly, it's like get a couple of these new items to the finish line. We've got, we've got, Coyote and Lambo. I mean, Coyote by itself is just such a huge animal in, in all of the different variants. I mean, you've mm -hmm. got Gen 3 stuff, you've got Mustang, you've got the truck stuff, then you step back into like the Voodoo and the Predator stuff, and then you've got all of the, you know, Gen 2 stuff, and then, you know, how people run all the race cars, whether it be the Voodoo heads or the, you know, reduced base circle stuff. And like, there's a huge, huge animal to kind of crack into all of that. So like, that's a big undertaking. Uh, you know, the Lambo stuff is definitely, you know, it's awesome. Like, like I said, it's probably the most fun car I've been in, you know, just to ride in. I haven't even driven it. Maybe I'll bug him and see if I can get it, drive it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, like that's a huge thing. I mean, you know, even going down into like a lot of the, the side-by-side -side stuff or even like, you know, there's a, a few applications that we've been kind of back burnering, like, uh, the FA 20, 20 and 24, the Subaru stuff. Yeah. Um, the new GR Corolla, the little three cylinder is probably a pretty, I mean, it's a cool little platform. Like we've definitely, we just kind of launched spring kits and, um, valves are in the works at this point. So it's like, you know, we're going to get to cams at kind of the same time we, we roll out a lot of the, the, uh, the FA, but you know, that's, that's, that's more of a, a glimpse into the future as far as into, to summer 2025. And then, you know, you never know, like there's, 
there's plenty of things on my board to do. Um, no, no C8 stuff? Um, you know, I'm not going to say no to it. Um, I just, I, you know, there's a lot of these things that are really in our wheelhouse that will kind of get done. And, you know, mm -hmm. as things grow and, and, and we have, you know, some time to put at it, like I, I could see us being in that space. Like, I just don't know how long that, you know, the flat plane stuff's awesome. And I haven't looked at it. I, and I'm not really a hundred percent sure as far as the limitations of where it's at or, or what it is. So it's, it, it could be one of those systems that works great. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there's ways to improve it. You know, are we going to go back and touch on the push rod stuff? Uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that do that, but you know, you kind of can't turn your, your, your back to the fact that there's probably more LS motors produced than any other engine out there. Right. Like, yeah, not everybody's going to put a cam in it and whatever, but there's, there's the most of them, you know, there's 2 million of those things floating around. So like, that's a huge, and they're still making them. So do you ever look at things like that and say like, where other, other, I guess, products like, let's say for an LS and say, why didn't we do that? Not even why, but like, <laughs> how could we improve that? Like, what are these guys doing? I could, I could probably do something better. Does I mean, that I, ever like spark up anything for you? Like, absolutely. You stuff? I mean, I, I, I've seen some, some people in that side of the industry that's made stuff and I've looked at it and been like, wow, this is what they put out. Like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously that's like the light bulb goes on like, yeah, I mean, but you know, it's one of those things like, you know, how many platforms can we, we be vested to like, where, where, where does it stop? Like, yeah, there's a lot of car manufacturers. Like we're, we're only one company. Like you got to kind of set your boundaries and, and figure out, you know, where you're at. I mean, again, I don't know. As long as they're making stuff, they're not putting EVs in it. You never know. Chop. Chop. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'm not that like to me it's like I don't necessarily think that's the greatest thing in the world. Like I'm more about like the high strung like high RPM just winging it. Like that to me is like music to my ears, not just the car at idle like about to sound like it's about to stop running. But like I want to know I want to know like the science behind it. Well, it's just the amount of it's basically you're 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 dealing with the amount of overlap. Like the time that they're both open, that's what creates it. So like obviously if you advance the intake cam away from it, it's gonna run smoother. So it's more about the fact that it's trying to struggle to push air all the way through it. But are you losing drivability? Absolutely. Like think about the guy that can't hardly drive in a parking lot because this car's hardly running. Yeah. So now what happens when you're phasing the cams to get that chop? I mean, so in a car that actually has like phase angle control, like, you know, whatever your variable valve to control, like obviously you, you can do that. You can make an OEM cam sound like it sound like it or actually chopped. I mean, it's all it is, is it's, it's, it's a sound, right? Like that's all it is. So, I mean, it's just a matter of, of tuning that intake cam retarding it so that it lopes. Interesting. And that's why on, I mean, obviously, you know, on a big NA setup that where it's fixed and it's not variable, like, you know, they build that in there so that at higher RPM, it's moving the air through and it still can clean the cylinder at higher RPMs. That's why you run that much overlap. However, like when it's idling and it's fixed because it's set up to run, like that's why it's doing it. Mm. So like, yeah, in a, with phase angle control, the only people that are doing that are the people that want it to sound like that. Right. Which more like the GTRs. I don't know if you saw that before the, the previous podcast. Oh, like, I missed it. Did I? It was like uh, it was it was months ago. Um, but <laughs> workhorse, uh, they were saying that the Coyote copied the GTR. Oh, I mean, dude, they've been doing that in the the Evo nines and everything else since you know oh six oh seven. So I don't know if you would say that they copied anybody. Well, he was saying. Well, they, no, they were basically saying like the way the the way the the power is being made between the two, like the GTR and the and the Coyote is very similar. So like they said, basically that Ford uh, copied. I mean, <laughs> not in my honest, opinion, like crazy. that's two totally different platforms. I mean, I guess one's, I mean, really like a direct acting bucket versus a type two finger follower in the cylinder head down to a V8 versus a V6 and Porsche. I mean, mm, I think people don't I think even that's realize a little that they thin. were, yeah, they, they were, they were joking though. They were kind of like messing around. They were like having like a friendly kind of band. Hey man, so. there's nothing wrong with that. But everybody took it like, oh, these guys are, what, what are you talking about? Like that doesn't even make any sense. Like, hey man, that's how it works sometimes, right? Yeah. I mean, but it was pretty interesting when they were explaining, I was like, oh, like you bought into sense. it. You're like, I got it. Well, yeah. Cause they were explaining like the way it makes, like he was just really into it. And I yeah. was like, 
you're either you study this already or you kind of I mean, it's all it, math right? like right like that's that's what it all boils down to like i i guess no <laughs> no i'm not on board with that <laughs> he said no so basically chopping is not something that people do people call you up and ask about that like oh i mean i have people that are like oh yeah i really want it to lope or like chop or whatever yeah. and it's like uh, you i mean I've, if it's usually if it's one of the cars that has it's like do you can do that with your stock cam like if that's all you're after like you can like, do it with the stock cam. You can do it with stock car. cam. Like you don't need to buy a set of S threes. Like just do it with the stock. Just tell your tuner. Like they'll do it. Interesting. But like I want my shit to sound like it's fast, but it doesn't need to be fast. <laughs> That's what it's about. So there's no performance benefit whatsoever. None. Zero. Just On a dual overhead cam that has phase angle control. Oh, I'm not talking about like LSs and stuff. No, well, that's different. Again, that's fixed. Right. Like it's fixed into the head. So like, or in the cam. So like, yes, that's the benefit of being able to access the higher RPM band stuff. Got you. So that's the, that's what it really is about is the fact that you can utilize that. It's, it's the noise of saying, hey, my, my engine runs best at high RPM, mm -hmm. but it's an idle in a parking lot. So yes, in that case, that cam is set up to go fast in a dual overhead cam. Like all it is is it's the fact that you're you're twisting the phasers, right? So it's really just a noise thing. Like, so one's fixed, yes, versus the other that's not. So it's like you just want it to do that, right? If so here's can... my question: What sounds better, a car that sounds like it's going to stall, or one that's like 1,200 RPM idle and it just sounds like it's about to haul ass? In your opinion, depends on the, depends on the the car. Yeah, I think if it it's like on. if it's like an old muscle car, like you want the sound, like it's you know that's a lot about like. It's like everybody said, like, oh, is everybody going to watch Formula E or, or some kind of EV racing? And it's like, you know, there's a huge, there's a huge part of racing that's sound. And the yeah. idea of a car without noise, screeching tires going by is just not a track. Like, would you go watch drifting if there was no noise, like from the engine? What would that sound like? <laughs> what would a drag strip sound like with no like it's just tire screech. Like that does not excite me at all. You're right. Yeah, I didn't think about it like that. You know, or like if you go to an F1 race or NASCAR, I don't think I've been to two NASCAR events in my entire life. But it's like, there's something about like feeling it and hearing it. And it's not just like, ow, oh, that thing's going fast. It's like, you gotta, you gotta hear it. Right. Like there's a whole sense that's involved there. And like, that's not there with those cars. And that's why I just don't, I mean, they're fast, don't get me wrong, but I'm just like, this is, I mean, like you listen to a, a cup car at idle, like those things sound like they're about to haul ass. Yeah. You know, you step on the gas and it's just rips through the RPMs quick and you're like, yeah. You're at that, but that's what I'm, that's what I said before, characters. It, there's, it depends what kind of car it is. I get yeah. that. And I, I obviously like being more into the small displacement, high RPM engines. Because the higher RPM has more character, I feel like. They, they rev, when, the, when they rev higher- They sing to like you, baby. They yeah. sing to you. They all sing to you. I get it. Except the EVs, they don't sing to you. Well, that's probably why I like the Coyotes. Yeah. Probably the main reason why I've never been into American cars, because I just always had a thing for like high revving cars, more sound. That's a, more of a Ford thing too. I mean, I like Ford engines. There's a lot of similarities to Ford engines and a well, lot of the- with the dual overhead cam stuff too now, it's like- and I love it. It's like, there's four can like, I know there's more stuff in there. It's 32 valve. Like it's a lot. Yeah. It's like, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for activities. Right. So like, I think it's the next level. I think so. I think so too. I mean, it's been there. It's not like it's yeah, not there. Yeah. This is great, man. Um, a lot of information. Um, really appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Um, so tell if you, oh, you don't even have a YouTube or anything, right? You just got an Instagram. We got Instagram. We don't have YouTube, right? Yeah, so. If, no. <laughs> we got cool. lights, though, so who knows? The sky's the limit. Uh-oh, yeah. He went out and bought some lights for this. <laughs> you guys can see it's pretty cool. Um, so tell the viewers where to find you. Uh, where to find us? Uh, Power-division.com is the website. Um, GSC Power is Instagram. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to South Carolina. Thanks for not bringing a hurricane with you. Yeah, not this time around. Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming. For those of you who are listening and watching, make sure you guys are listening on all streaming platforms and make sure you guys like, share, comment, and subscribe. Shout out to my girlfriend for this lovely iPad today. It helped. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue to use it, but it definitely was a help today. Um, so shout out to my girl for that. And if you guys are uh, on the, I think on the, what is it? The um, 
the website. Make sure you guys cop some merch as well. Support the brand. And yeah, until next time, guys, catch you on the next one. Peace.